welcome to Pepper Shock Media's Marketing Expedition Podcast, keeping you up to date with the latest in marketing and advertising. Now, here's your host, Ray Allen. Welcome to the Marketing Expedition Podcast. I'm Ray Allen, President and CEO of Pepper Shock Media, and I'm the Chief Culture Officer here. And I have with me Mr. Ron Price uh, from Price Associates and one of my favorite mentors. And he's served on the Pepper Shock Advisory Board, and he's been a client and a vendor and all of the above. And I got to go through the Complete Leader Program with him. Ron, welcome to the show. Thank you, Ray. It's good to see you again. And we really have done a lot of things together, haven't we? We have. Yeah. We started way back when. You reminded me we went to a Mexican restaurant down in the basement in uh, downtown Nampa when we very first started together or well, right. in business together but Rotary yep. right yeah plus we've been Rotarians for quite some time and you yeah. did an excellent job being the president of our club a couple of years ago oh, thank you as did you you were the club president yeah too. but it was not a couple of years oh, ago okay. it was a long <laughs> it was back before I had all this gray hair aha uh-huh, aha uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm sure I got a couple of gray hair from it too <laughs> you got a couple of phone calls from me too <laughs> <laughs> Ron, I need help. <laughs> yeah. So we are talking about culture and and branding and you know branding is a part of your culture, culture is a part of your branding, but in terms of leadership, uh, we're talking about being the chief culture officer. Tell me what is it that inspires you to inspire others to be the chief culture officer in their companies? I, I, it really goes to the core of my personal mission and our company mission. My personal mission is to help people discover and pursue their greatest potential. I don't think it's smart for us to compare ourselves against others. We should be comparing ourselves against who we could become. And when I see a leader that I really admire, it's, I, that's what I see happening is they're stretching toward who they could be and really not thinking about whether they're better than the person next door. That's my personal mission. Our company mission is to help leaders grow and as a consequence of their growth, make a big splash. Really, the way we say it is we want them to grow and change their worlds. And another way to say it would be that we want to help grow great leaders. And at my age, I'm 65 right now, at my age, I'm thinking about how can I optimize my impact? And it's really by helping other leaders be more impactful. And that's been a great joy, a great privilege. I'm so grateful that I have this opportunity to support leaders who are going to change the world. And you've done this for a while now. Tell me about some of the things that you've gone through with your own company and all of the facilitators that you have and all the associates you have now and some of the transitions that you've done in helping leaders become their full potential. I've got to go back a ways because I've been involved in leadership roles for, I think, 49 years now. And my first exposure, most of my early experience with leadership, I think, was more accident. I was invited or asked to take something, and I it was just for the practical purpose of getting something done. I didn't really have a vision or I didn't have a passion for what leadership was. But I, my first experience in leadership was that I studied theater in school. Mm-hmm. And I figured out early on that I probably wasn't going to be a leading actor. Uh. And I took an interest in all the things that were happening behind the scenes, and I became a director. So I, I wrote a few plays. You've never heard of any of them because they weren't very good. <laughs> and I directed plays. And I, I started thinking about how do you bring the best out in other people back then. Yeah. And then I've been in a lot of different careers since then. I've had anybody who looks at my career path would say I probably have needed a therapist somewhere along the line. (laughs) But it always had to do with leading. And the leading was always in the context of not telling other people what to do, but helping to bring out the best in other people. So my last corporate position, I um, was really fortunate to come into a company in a leadership role just when it was on the edge of a big big growth spurt. Mm. And as a consequence, I was there 11 years and eventually became the president of the company and had the ability or the opportunity or the privilege to open up business in eight different countries. And what a wonderful experience that was. I had to deal with building infrastructure, the first website for our company ever, had to uh, learn how to deal with culture and how it changes from country to country right 
And can we hold on to our core values in our business, even though we're operating in different cultures in different countries, establishing and building leadership teams, developing a board of directors. I got to do all these wonderful things, process improvement work. Mm -hmm. It was just a phenomenal experience. And at the end of 11 years, I felt like I probably needed to turn the baton over to somebody else. So I retired, Mm -hmm. let the board of directors know that I was leaving and gave them six months to find my replacement. And after taking some time off and realizing that I wasn't really retiring from life, I was just retiring from that job. Yeah. that it was time for me to start something new and decided that I had had my time in the spotlight. I'd had my fun as the top leader. I wanted to support other people at that point. So that's what caused us to start Price Associates. And yeah, it's been a wonderful ride. We've got a fantastic team of people that I really love and that I really believe in the work that they do. And we're figuring out now how we can continue to serve more and more people, more and more clients. So in our mind right now today, we're thinking a lot about and talking a lot about scaling. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And you've been, with your company now, you've been all over the country, all over the world. Yeah. Tell me, tell me, you said, how many countries are you operating in? Well, I know that I've done work personally in 10 different countries, Um, but we have people who are part of our colleagues, Mm -hmm. our colleague network. They're using our materials and we support them and work with them regularly in probably 15 to 20 countries right now. One of our books, The Complete Leader, is now published in, in addition to English. It's published in Turkish and Spanish and Chinese and French. The French is not printed yet. They're going through the final edits of it. And it's being negotiated in a number of other languages right now by uh, our foreign rights editor. Oh, my goodness. So um, those tend to bring us invitations. And we have a website called Mm thecompleteleader.org, which you actually Mm -hmm. have had a lot of uh, help. You've helped Mm -hmm. us a lot in Mm -hmm. supporting it. And every month we get inquiries from multiple countries with people who want to find out more about what we're doing and whether or not we can do a program in their country. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting because in today's world, you can either look at it as an optimist and say that we can touch any place in the world because of digital media and the presence that you have on the internet, or you can look at it as a pessimist and say, watch out, the competitors are coming from everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> right. It depends on what your mindset is. Totally. And we've decided that our mindset's going to be optimistic and that the message we have and the tools we have to help people are applicable anywhere that somebody wants to pick them up and run with them. So how, from a marketing perspective, because this is the Marketing Expedition podcast, what would you say the percentage of business has come because of the books that you have written? Would you say 90%, 80%? Is having books out there a great way to get the business? And I mean, how much of it is because of the book or because of what you do? Or, you know, what, what would you say percentage-wise? Well, first of all, um, I'm not a marketing expert, but I'll tell you what my opinion is about marketing. Oh, I'd love to hear it. I believe marketing is about impressions. Mm-hmm. It's not about sales. Right. And impressions come from a lot of different places. So it's what happens on the Internet. It's what happens through your email. It's what happens when people see you at a chamber event. It's what happens when somebody refers you because you've done work with them before. It's the accumulation of all those impressions the brand that create your brand. Way. Yeah, yeah that good. create your reputation, the way that people think about you. And I'm convinced that people have an opinion about you before you open your mouth mm-hmm. because of all these impressions. If they've heard of your name before, if they've never heard of your name before, that's an impression right there. I've never heard of that guy before. Or, oh, I've heard so much about him. He's great, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So now we come back to your question about books. Mm -hmm. So I think books are wonderful business cards. Yeah. And traditionally, books gave you a lot of credibility. Mm -hmm. I've, I've seen several surveys in the past that said that the number one respected title for somebody was author. Uh, in this country, obviously better than a politician. Well, <laughs> but better I than should a, hope so. <laughs> better than a company leader, mm-hmm. better than a coach. Better mm-hmm. an author was the number one title. I will tell you that because of the change in publishing, and because mm-hmm. it's so easy to publish these days, and we have so much self-publishing going on, right. 
that it's lost a little bit of its luster now. Mm. It's, it doesn't have quite the credibility that it had. But having said that, one of the wonderful things about writing a book that represents the work you do is it, it's a cathartic experience in that it gets you to think very clearly about what are you willing to put in print that you won't be able to take back later. Right. It is. And there's no forgiveness mm-hmm. once you've made a mistake in a book. And so it's a great experience for you to clarify mm-hmm. what matters to you and what's important to you. And in the con- it, 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 to the extent that you've done that, and it's well designed, mm-hmm. it's attractive, mm-hmm. and it's engaging so that people pick it up and are interested in it, then I think it's not just a great business card. I think it's a great now we've moved from marketing into a selling tool. Mm-hmm. It's helping people build trust. Because to me, the difference between marketing and sales is, okay, in marketing, they're getting to know about me and they're developing an opinion about me. In sales, the question is, can I help them solve a problem? Mm-hmm. Can I help them fulfill a vision? That becomes much more personal. And it's really more about the buyer than it is the seller. So it's a whole different environment when you talk about selling versus marketing. Yeah. And when you know you can find your one of your books at the airport, right? That's got to be something you're proud of. Tell me. Yeah, about it's that. well, it's pretty cool. Yeah, it's um, I guess those things don't impress me the way maybe they would have when I was younger. I can tell you what did impress me is when I walked into an airport and saw my son on the cover of a magazine sitting in the uh. airport store. Now that was emotional the first time that ever happened. He's been on, uh, I think, three or four magazine covers now, so I'm not quite as impressed anymore as I once was. (laughs) But that's pretty shocking to walk into an airport and you see your son on the cover of a magazine. That's pretty cool. That is pretty cool, too. Yeah, and he did it. He's very disruptive. Mm -hmm. Originally, he did it because he was named the Entrepreneur of the Year for the whole country for the Small Business Administration. So he was on the cover of Entrepreneur Magazine. But Mm -hmm. um, then he decided he was going to raise the minimum wage for his employees to $70,000 a year. And one of the biggest misunderstandings is people thinking that he decided to make everybody's salary the same. That's Uh not what he decided. He just decided to raise the minimum wage to Uh $70,000 a year. And that put him on the cover of Inc. magazine with the question, is this the best boss in the the world? Right. Yeah, I don't don't think he really bought that press. (laughs) But... It really has given him a great platform, and he's been wise in how he's used that platform. This is about marketing. Mm-hmm. The first time he showed up on a cover, I, I called him up and told him what an emotional experience it was. And then I said, Dan, your life's never going to be the same. Yeah. Once that's happened, it's changed forever. And if you know who you are and you know where you're going, you'll pass this test. Mm-hmm. But if you don't know who you are, somebody else is going to define you and they'll probably take you somewhere you shouldn't be. Mm-hmm. And yeah. um, he paid attention to it after I told him that about the 10th time. That's good. <laughs> yeah, and he's made, God's advice. <laughs> he's made that platform that was given to him count. He's right. made it valuable. And I, it's really a great joy for me to watch the way that he's living his life out of principles and values that he's decided are important to him. Yeah. Not because I always agree with them, but because I know that they're deep convictions that he shares. Mm-hmm. And getting back to our story about marketing and branding, that's yeah. really at the core of it. You cannot manufacture a brand. Yeah, You can build a brand, mm-hmm. but if you want it to be a successful brand, it needs to be built around some deep convictions. And it's not just about making money. Of course, as a business, we want to make money, but it's about believing in something enough mm-hmm. that you're willing to risk which is what the core of an entrepreneur is, is somebody who's willing to take a risk, that you're willing to risk comfort, sometimes finance, Mm -hmm. other things, because you think it's valuable enough for you to advance this. And that's what creates companies like Pepper Shock Media. (laughs) Thanks. <laughs> yeah, I uh, I agree with you that it would be a wonderful, amazing experience to be able to watch your own child grow up into the leader that they become. 
I mean, I have a 11 and 13 year old. I can only imagine, you know, in years to come what that's going to be like. But I already see now in my kids the things that they pick up from from us, from being leaders and, you know, ways that we interact with our employees and our vendors and our clients and, you know, the community and seeing them translate that into how they interact. Uh, they're boys, uh, Boy Scouts and, um, you know, being able to share that experience, I think, is, is really, really neat. Yeah, yeah I think I think. Uh, the final test and pleasure of leading is what happens when you pass the baton to others. So in the this legacy, case, right? I was talking about one of my sons. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we have five boys and a girl, and we're proud of what they've all done. They're all living their lives according to a strong set of values that they have. And I have to confess, their mother gets most of the credit for it because of the way she invested in them. But even beyond your children, it's when you can pass the baton on to somebody else and have confidence that they're not just going to match up to what you've done, but they're actually going to take it further. Mm -hmm. Once you accept that that's really the greatest joy you have, and it's not about your own personal accolades, but it's about being able to make a difference, there's, I don't think there's any greater joy than knowing that those people are going to take it further than you ever could have yourself. Yeah, exceeding expectations and being able to deliver way more than what you set them out to, to what the path that they thought that they were going to go. I love that too. Yeah. So talking about marketing and branding and culture for P Price Associates, you mentioned the books that you do and the programs that you put on. You also do tests for people. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that a little bit. Mm -hmm. So I, I was first introduced to this idea of using assessments online to assessments, capture. Assessments, not tests. Assessments, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because you can't pass or fail. That's right. The purpose of these assessments is to help people develop more self-awareness. Mm -hmm. And they're designed to capture their self-concept. And I first became aware of them, really started to look at them in 1997 when I was in a program called Coach University. It was like a master's program in coaching in the early days. And um, I was interested, curious, didn't know how much I believed in them, but I thought I would begin exploring and testing and, ex and, and, de and experimenting with them. And when we started Price Associates in 2004, I knew right from the get-go that those were going to be one of the sets of tools that we would use because they really help leaders self-evaluate, understand their strengths better, Mm -hmm. And, of course, the greater your strength, the bigger the shadow that it casts. So help them understand the shadows that their strengths cast as well. And the company that I was originally introduced to for this is a company called TTI Success Insights. And I was very impressed with their commitment to research. I was impressed with their commitment to helping people like me who are mm -hmm. helping leaders and um, they had a pretty good reach. It turns out that they've now run somewhere between 35 and 40 million assessments for people oh, around wow. the world. Their assessments are available in 40 different languages, and they're used in 90 countries. And they're not the most famous because they work underneath the radar a lot because they don't sell assessments directly to any company. They make them available to companies like ours so that then we can help our clients be Facilitate successful. Facilitate them and process yeah. what they mean and how your teams can work together because you might have a, somebody who's, you know, on high I, influential and dominant, whereas somebody else on your team might be supportive and compliant, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and we actually now have seven different individual assessments that we use to understand people from different perspectives, different points of view. Wow. You know, their TTI Success Insights, we tried to figure out what they do in annual revenue based on all of the people they support like us. Mm -hmm. And the closest we can get is that it's somewhere north of a billion dollars a wow. year. Wow, I had no idea. And, and they're a secret yeah. because they don't go direct to the Fortune 500 companies. It all happens through... We're called Price Associates, but we're using TTI mm -hmm. Success Insights tools. And and wasn't uh, Price Associates recently awarded um, something? Tell us about that. Yeah, you, you might have had a little something to do with it. <laughs> we, we were recognized as the 2019 um, brand ambassador of the year for the whole world wow. because of the relationship that we have with TTI Success Insights and the way that people like Pepper Shock have yeah. helped us. Oh. So, yeah, we were really happy for that.
I'm happy for you. Congratulations on that, because that's a big deal, especially if they support all of these other companies just like you. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. 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 We're really grateful. So I mentioned seven different assessments. So yeah. behavioral style, you've mentioned that, mm-hmm. DISC. The mm-hmm. next one that we look at is why people do what they do. DISC is about how you get it done. Mm-hmm. It's called driving forces. It's what is it that drives you? Where do you get your sense of fulfillment and achievement from in your work? And people get it from different places. The third one we look at takes a look at unconscious bias and how it affects people's judgments mm-hmm. in, in decision-making, things like that. The fourth one measures 25 different leadership skills and their level of mastery of those skills. Fifth Mm -hmm. is emotional intelligence, Mm -hmm. which is a big factor in being a strong leader today because Mm -hmm. um, we live in a time where we need to recognize the human part Mm -hmm. of our workers, Mm -hmm. not just what what they're going to get done for us. Number six is a stress assessment that takes a look at eight different sources of stress, Mm -hmm. how people are experiencing them and how they might be affecting them physically, emotionally, mentally, or Mm -hmm. behaviorally. And then the seventh and the last one is a sales skills assessment that helps people understand where they're at in understanding how to influence others and how they can continue to grow that. Mm -hmm. So it's really a great battery of assessments that we can use. One of the challenges I took on in 2009 was to purchase the master distributorship for greater China for all of these assessments. Yeah. The first thing we had to do is get them all translated. Right, right. Yeah, we've had a full-time translator for 10 years now in our office in China. And um, I wanted to make a little contribution to what I saw as a a fast-growing company that needed to have more reflection around leadership and individual talent and things like that. So that was one of the countries I've had a chance to spend a lot of time in. But as a result of my relationship with TTI Success Insights, I've gotten my second and third and fourth world tour out of life. Yeah, It's been wonderful. And you've somewhat closed the chapter on China and have let the people there uh, get their wings and fly. And now you have over a thousand facilitators, you said? We've divested most of our ownership in China. We still own a little bit of it, but all of the management is local now. We have offices in Shanghai and Beijing, and we're opening up a couple more offices in uh, 2019. But I only look at the board of directors minutes anymore. I'm not involved in the the day-to-day running of it. And I made my last, I think I've been there 60 times. I made my last trip there to say goodbye to everybody. Yeah. Congratulations. Bittersweet, but yet happy moments. Yeah. And and there are new challenges, other Mm -hmm. things. Right now we have Mm -hmm. a lot of work growing in Kenya and uh, we have people using our programs in Ireland and in Spain and all through Latin America and in Turkey. And we're negotiating with a university in Azerbaijan right now. We're looking at possibilities in Kazakhstan. I'm going to have to look at a globe. (laughs) Yeah, I know. Me too. That's good. Me too. And and I'm trying to slow down, but our team keeps picking up the pace. How many associates and how many team do you, how many do you have now? So our leadership team is five people who do consulting, coaching Mm -hmm. and facilitating Our staff, our administrative staff is a combination of people who work with us exclusively Mm -hmm. and people that we contract with Mm -hmm. for doing work. And it's really hard to say how large that team is because people like you, we consider to be a part of our team there. Mm -hmm. And then we have colleagues who have been certified in our programs to deliver them and who are certified as coaches. Any given time, we probably have somewhere in the range of 200 to 300 executives that we're coaching around the world. And so when you look at that, what we refer to as our faculty, right now we have 60 members of our faculty, and that's continuing to grow. And as we think about scaling, that's part we're talking about how do we support them, how do we continue to give them more materials and train them, and how do we build all the infrastructure so that we do a good job of serving them because they're more and more becoming our customers. Are you recruiting facilitators? How does somebody become a facilitator or your faculty? How do they be, how do they get involved? At this point, we're not recruiting. At this point, uh, people mostly are coming to us because Mm -hmm. they see our books Mm -hmm. or they see our websites and they ask how they can get involved. Mm -hmm. They might see one of our people speak at an event and Mm -hmm. say, that sounds like it's something I'd be interested in. And it's not easy to be 
become a part of our faculty is at least a two-year process right. of going through learning Training. and practice and mm -hmm. shadowing others and things like that. Maybe someday we'll start doing the recruiting. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very cognizant right now of my own mortality and thinking about how important it is for us to identify people who are earlier in their career mm -hmm. and to give them a vision for how they could be involved with something like us and get started on that path. Mm -hmm. Ray, that because of the nature of what we do, it, you really can't take somebody right out of college right. and they put them into a productive yeah. role because mm -hmm. they're, they're experts mm -hmm. and they have to have the experience, not just the education, but they have to have the experience to be able to do it. So I have to say, I'm always recruiting in my brain, mm -hmm. but we're not putting ads in the paper. And mm -hmm. we say it's really hard to join our team and easy to leave. Because ah. one of the things we've done is train a lot of other people who then go on and say they want to start their own business, which mm -hmm. is fine with us. Because mm -hmm. our, our mission is to change the world. If they're going to do it through a different brand, that's okay with me. Yeah. Um, of course, we have enough people who want to stay with us that mm -hmm. it keeps us getting stronger and stronger. Mm -hmm. But... Um, it's what a it's a wonderful journey, yeah. because of the people that we get to work with, the people that we get to serve, and that in and of itself tends to attract people to us who want to be a part of what we're doing. Right, and let's talk about the about the complete leader program. Uh, I got to go through the first Boise cohort, but now you have cohorts all over. Mm -hmm. And tell us what it, that process is. Yeah, we've, uh, so we call it a cohort, a typical complete leader program, although we customize everyone to the people who are part of that program. But a typical program has 12 to 20 people in it. I think your cohort had 23. We did. It was yeah. a few more. Mm -hmm. And it's, a, it's like an EMBA program. So a, an executive MBA program is something that you go through be, while you're still doing your regular job. Mm hmm so we wanted to, to design it that way, and we wanted to provide practical, relevant content around leadership skills and improving your leadership effectiveness. We wanted to create an environment that was safe and fun so that people could get to know each other and they would learn from each other. It wasn't just going to be a lecture up front. And we wanted it to be very interactive so that it's not a classroom kind of a setting, but there's a lot of variety going on. And we wanted to leave people with a framework and resources that they could use for the rest of their career. So yes. it wasn't a graduation and got goodbye, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but it was something that we were hoping they'd come back to over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. So On the Complete Leader we uh, website, completeleader.org, and you can yep. continue to get more information all the time. Right. Yeah, yeah right. that's great. That, that's correct. Yeah. And so I think we've done around 30 cohorts now in, I think we've done cohorts in 10 countries. Wow. I, I never really stopped to count it, but I think that's what it's been. Nice. And we focus on self-awareness, somebody understanding themselves better. So we use some of these assessments that you mm -hmm. talked about. Mm -hmm. We focus on understanding others better. How do we understand how to organize around people's strengths and neutralize their weaknesses? And then we focus on skill development. So we have skills that fall into four categories. The thinking skills of a leader, the achieving skills of a leader, the relating or we might say supervising skills of a leader, mm -hmm. and then the importance of authenticity and character as a leader. So we work on developing those. We have subject matter experts who come in who've had years of experience in one particular area. And you know, because you mm -hmm. were a part of it, that mm -hmm. a lot of the most valuable things are when four or five members of the cohort put together team presentations on one of those skills where they go and explore it themselves and they come back and share something with us that's rich and creative and engaging. And I think always the teacher learns the most. Yeah, mine, when, one of them was team man, uh, time management and organization, which I still implement some of those things now, yeah. which is great. Yeah, that's great. And, <laughs> and it was needed. <laughs> and for those of us with a behavioral style like you and I have, we never have we never quit having to go back and look at those things. Because yeah. what comes natural for us is interacting with people. Yes. 
what's a little more work is staying organized. Yes, that's where I have to rely on other people to do that and bring their best uh, organization skills out to help me. <laughs> Which true. is great. Yeah, That's great leadership to let somebody else do the thing that either you don't enjoy or you're not as good at. Yep, for sure. And recognizing that that is something you aren't as good at need other people to help you do, for sure. So how do people uh, find out about the Complete Leader Program? Well, they can uh, write to info at thecompleteleader.org. Or they can write to me, Ron, at price-associates.com. And that's one of our big programs. Another really big program is called the Innovators Advantage Academy. If they're interested in innovation, they can write about that. And then we do a lot of senior leadership team building and strategy work and things like that. And coaching. Do you do a lot of one-on-one coaching anymore, or is it more? I don't myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I have a pretty small list of clients right now just because of my organizational responsibilities. But as I said, we're probably coaching between two and 300 executives at any given time. Right. In either group, team, or it's um, where you come in and work with the whole company or right. executive team, I see. Right. Yeah. Right. And the different associates do different areas of expertise because you've got five different core members and then all of the faculty right. from, from that. Yeah. 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 So, good. They do. They're all wonderful people. Good. And so you also uh, have some books out. What's going on there? Yeah. Tell me more. Well, um, you know, it goes back quite a few years. A guy, a mentor of mine named Charles Tremendous Jones. I met him when you brought him to Rotary. Yeah, yes, yeah. I remember. He was quite a character. You can't forget him, no, honestly. No, he was bigger than life. Yeah. He was on my case to write a book. And, and back in 1999, I finally acquiesced and wrote the first book. It was really more designed for the company that I ran back then. And he kept saying, come on, Ron, where's the next book? Where's the next book? So um, we had a book that came out called Treasure uh, the Treasure Inside. Treasure Inside. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 23 Unexpected Principles That Activate Greatness. And it's done well. It's, it's on uh, Amazon. Mm-hmm. You can get it in ebook formats. And we've, we've done well with that. I actually wrote that book for my kids, and I always joke that they won't read it, so I make it available to others. But <laughs> nice. truth is, they have, most of them have read it. I have a signed copy. I feel very <laughs> special. <laughs> In 2014, Randy Lisk and I published The Complete Leader, mm-hmm. which is the textbook that we use for our leadership development program. And now we have a workbook, too, to go with it. Yeah, yeah we mm-hmm. have The Companion, yeah. Yeah. and um, the the textbook is on audible as well right now so people can listen to it if they'd rather and then uh, in 2017 evans Baya and i published a book called the innovators advantage Mm -hmm. revealing the hidden connection between people and process we're really excited about the message in that book it's a very dense book Mm -hmm. but we've been using that to take organizations through transformational journeys of innovation and really doing big things, and it's really exciting to see what's happening with that. From that grew a uh, 12-month Innovators Advantage Academy, where people go through 12 days of training and then work on innovation projects as they go. And our our goal is always to create multiples of what the program costs in return mm-hmm. on investment right. within those right. first couple of years. So wait, 12 days in a row? or you 12 days th- over 12 months. Over 12 months. Yeah, we Got actually okay. stack it up front, and uh, then we have these innovation workshops where they're bringing their work back oh. and we're mm-hmm. critiquing it. Oh, nice. And then uh, we stay with them for another two years after they've graduated from the academy to continue to help get it integrated into their culture. That's right. I love it. And then in um, September of 2018, Stacy Ennis and I published Growing Influence, a story of how to lead with character, expertise, and impact. And it's getting a lot of traction. Yeah, we see done, it everywhere. We, we're really grateful. We were um, recently recognized by Axiom Book Awards as the number one business fable for 2018 love in it. the U.S., Congratulations, yeah, too, by the you. way. That's amazing. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. I have yeah. no doubt, though. I mean, I, I well, see that. I we, can see why. We really put our heart into it, and um, we've been really, really grateful with the response we've gotten from people. It's available in uh, Barnes & Noble stores, of course, online. It's mm-hmm. also available on Audible, and uh, it's going to be in 200 airports starting in oh, September. Oh, that's great. Yeah, oh, everyone can read it while they're flying. Yeah, <laughs> nice. well, uh, my understanding is they see it in an airport store and they take a picture of it so they can oh, order it later. <laughs> I see. Uh-huh. <laughs> a few people buy it because they're flying. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And we hope we hope that it's uh, reaching more and more people. I'm pretty ambitious with this book because of its message 
and because it connects head to heart, mm. my goal is for a million people to read it. And my publisher says I'm three quarters crazy. Wow. But that's okay. As long as I've got a quarter of sanity left, I'll continue <laughs> going forward. I have no doubt that you'll get your million dollar or million mark. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but that's great. Well, Ron, I really appreciate you coming on the Marketing Expedition show today with me. And from a friendship standpoint, I really appreciate you being my mentor all these years and just being somebody that I admire and look up to and inspire me every day. So thank you. And I have a lot of Ronisms that I use all the time. Your <laughs> quotes are, I continue to, as Ron Price says, so I just have to share well, that with you. <laughs> Ray, I, I'll tell you that I am slowly fading into the sunset, but for you, the best is yet to come. <laughs> thank you. All right. Well, hopefully you'll get some more Marketing Expedition podcasts to listen to. And thank you for joining us today. Thanks for listening to the Marketing Expedition podcast. Find more online at Peppershock.com. 